Welcome to Lead Follow, a podcast for pastors and leaders, hosted by MCUSA Executive Director Glenn Guyton. Join Glenn as he talks to folks across the denomination to help equip today's leaders who are leading while following Jesus. Hello, my name is Glenn Guyton, and during this season of Lead Follow, we'll be exploring ways to reimagine church. Today, I am pleased to welcome Iris De Leon Hartshorn, who will discuss ways that pastors, leaders, and congregations can evaluate their readiness and face their fears to create more resilient and responsive communities. Now, Iris serves as the Associate Executive Director of Operations and Director of Human Resources for Mennonite Church USA. She represents the staff on our Leadership Discernment Committee, and has worked to promote anti-racism across the denomination, serving as an anti-racism facilitator since 1995. Iris is also an intercultural development inventory administrator and a certified reinvention practitioner. Hello, Iris, and welcome to the program. Hi, Glenn, and thank you for having me. Well, it's so great to to have you, and it's it's not like you're like you're a stranger. We work together, so uh, uh, so it, it'll it'll be good sharing uh, some of the things that we do together, and some of the things that you are working on as part of your role with uh, Mennonite Church USA. So uh, we always start off with sort of an icebreaker, and uh, you're you're an expert facilitator, so I know you love these icebreakers. But uh, imagine this: uh, reimagining an organization involves transforming how it operates, thinks, and achieves its goals. It's also about taking a fresh, innovative approach to every aspect of the organization to enhance its efficiency, adaptability, and overall success. So if you could imagine or reimagine one thing in Mennonite Church USA, what would it be and why? Well, I thought about this, Glenn, because I think I'm going to be talking more specifics in the next question, but I was thinking in the broader sense of how I would like to see the church for the future. And I thought of Ecclesiastes 1, 9, where it says, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's not about just innovation, um, but it's about claiming who we are as a people of God. So the early Anabaptists were always on the fringe, but they had this huge impact on shaping what we now call the Radical Reformation. Right. Can we once again see ourselves on the margins in a country that exudes power rather than trying to see ourselves as just another denomination? So I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to see MCU and say, embrace who we are and shine a light as followers of Jesus from the margins. Now, what that looks like today is now up for discussion. Yeah, I appreciate that, Iris. And that's one of the things I appreciate you is bringing us back to the center of who we are as as Christian Anabaptists. And I think that's something we forget that, uh, I mean, we're a small denomination. Our co-worker Michael Danner calls it a boutique denomination, but we can't forget who we are, our, our Anabaptist history, our Anabaptist roots. I know that's important to you, but I also think that that's the framework when, from which we need to operate uh, as people that are members of this this denomination. If, if we if we try to become like everyone else, we, we I think we'll find ourselves in a in a pretty poor spot in 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 our in our denomination, and I think we lose something uh, that we offer the world. I agree. Yeah. So, so as we start to think about uh, reimagining structures and ministries, I mean, what are some of the key signs? that indicate whether a, a congregation or leadership team is actually ready for transformation? Well, I think one of the, the you know, we talk about the phrases of readiness for change, mm -hmm. but I think there's three elements to that. Your readiness, your ability to anticipate change. Okay, I like that. Um, your ability to actually design a process for change. And then your ability to implement that change. Mm. I always talk about if you don't have a driver to implement mm -hmm. the design, you're going nowhere. Yeah. Um, and if you 
can anticipate the change and you start making changes without a good design, you create chaos. So I think you really need those three elements. Now, we actually have a tool that we use to access that. And I'll just say in the beginning, as a, a trainer for so many years, there's no perfect tool. Right. But what I tell people is use the tool and get what you can from that tool. Right. Um, because if you're searching for the perfect tool to give you the perfect answer, you will never find it. <laughs> you, you, you know, right. It, 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 and, and let me, you talk about tools. And so just imagine hammers and sc screwdrivers. Those are literal tools. Do they just have one type of hammer? No, they're like 50 different types of hammers, you know, and different lengths of hammer, different materials. But they all do the same thing. Basically, you know, you, you pound a nail on his head, but there are some that do a specific aspect of that better than than others but you can find right. a general hammer right right um there's also another element um i'm a big fan of malcolm gladwell yeah uh, he's an author and mm -hmm. back in the day he wrote a book called the tipping point oh and yeah actually i just heard an interview of him uh he has a new book out kind of reviewing 25 years later what he yeah. wrote on the tipping point but one of the things about the tipping point is that he he uh, embeds that in the framework of an epidemic. Mm. And so his theory is that a small group can become super spreaders. Oh, wow. So a seed of an idea and a small group, like again, well, it goes back to my whole thing about Anabaptists on the margins. Right. Small group, big impact. Right. Um, also, I think you need to be aware of who are the explorers mm -hmm. or the the idea idea people in your group, but who are also the natural networkers. Right. Because you can have a great idea, but if you don't know how to communicate that, if you don't have a way to naturally network with people, um, the idea goes nowhere. So I think those things are really crucial uh, when we're thinking about change and getting ready for change yeah you know there's a, a scripture uh first chronicles 12 uh, verse 32 that talks about uh the sons of ishakar who understood the times and knew what israel should do you know they were they were small uh and but, but they were powerful right they understood like like right. you, you talk about anticipating change you know we need people with these different skill sets. And I think that we as Anabaptists uh, have a lot to offer if we remember who we, who we are. Um, right. So you, you named three things, uh, anticipate, design and implement. I think those are really important um, aspects. I feel like a lot of meetings I'm in that there's another one, whine, whine about change. I don't know where does that fit in the process? Like we gonna whine and complain about the change, but we, but we never, we never start doing the things that we yeah. need to do like like we're not anticipating as the church i think we are notorious uh in the church for being behind but but other organizations are like that right and, yeah, but then, I think, yeah go ahead i think you know also you know i think educational systems are also yeah, yeah. really hard to move no uh, i think religious and educational systems yeah. are probably the hardest groups to for change yeah and so so how do we help people that's so this is a question i mean that we we talk about this thing like you know, so we, we've come up with some tools and, and we've come up with this framework to help us as a, as a church, but there's so much resistance. I mean, I'm, again, I'm, I'm working with, with organizations. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get too specific, but, you know, transformation is, is, is a word that we all throw out in the church. Uh, even we, we do it as far as our uh, renewed commitments transformed by the Holy Spirit. Right. But it's so hard to get transformative thinking into any level of our, our denomination. I mean, so why is that? I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks to change is being able to face our fears about change. Yeah. I think we have to be honest that there is a cost to change. Yeah. Uh, and when a congregation or a leadership team can face their fears and put them into a perspective yeah. of what they can actually direct or influence, and what are the things they have no influence? I find that most organizations spend more time on what they can't influence yeah. or change. Um, and 
and they have no control over than the actual things they could. Mm -hmm. And, but I think it's hard for us to really name our fears. Um, we don't like not knowing and being able to see what's ahead. And mm -hmm. like when we talked about people that have ideas or can anticipate change. Yeah. I think the reason they don't have as much of the fear factor is because they can in some way imagine what it will look like Yeah, where a lot of people can't imagine it. They're used to what they're, they're used to. Um, yeah. They feel comfortable there. And, you know, we actually have this tool, another tool that we have, we call the bucket list where bucket list, people right. list what their fears are yeah. and they put them in this, this circle of what, what do they have direct uh, inf um, say over? Yeah. Those are the things you should be working on. And what do you have influence in? So how can you be collaborative and work with others in a, in a space where you have influence? And then the third one is those are things you can't control. Now, yeah. we're human beings, so we're still going to worry about those. Right. But if we could put in a perspective of 20% of our time is on that and 80% on the other, it would make a big shift and it would help kind of break that stumbling block of, and, you know, working toward change. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think a, a lot of us want to look back in this denomination. Uh, a lot of people that I, I guess, engage with it and I, and I understand it, right. I understand it. You know, anytime we have change, there's also, there's this sense of loss, but uh, I, I think leaders have to help people through that. Right. Uh, there have been a number of things that have changed since I've become executive director of Mennonite Church USA. You know, we still get calls, and I will name some of these things, it might be dangerous for me to do it, but I'm going to do it. Uh, still get calls about uh, uh, Scottsdale, right? We had, a, the Mennonite Publishing had some property in Scottsdale. I mean, it's been decades since that property was utilized, but there are people that were there, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago that still think that we should invest in that that building. Uh, we are doing making some changes with Peace Academics Center, which was a thriving ministry at one point, but after years of uh, deteriorating support, you know, staff availability, funding, even students from that uh, that mm -hmm. area, you know, people still say, "Well, when I did it forty years ago, it's not forty years ago. It's, it's not sustainable, and the denomination is a lot smaller." So, so yeah, so these fears, I mean, it's, it's real. It's, it's fear. It's uh, some nostalgia. I guess maybe it's a sense of loss. And uh, we, I, I, yeah, whose responsibility is it, Iris? To, it, yeah, who's, who do you see as the, the, who in our sphere has the responsibility to help people navigate those fears? I mean, I think that, you know, we have, we have a lot of tools, our, our denomination does have. Um, and I think it's people that are, are not just trained, but they're also, what I, I think also, if people are, are trained to even facilitate a conversation mm -hmm. at even a congregational level. Even you could do that in Sunday school hmm. to talk about what are your fears. I mean, yeah. if we get down to the basics of your local congregation. Um, I know I'm working with one congregation on an issue that has elevated a lot of fear right. um, for some people. Right. So we have different avenues going on. Um, we're going to be, we're talking with the BIPOC community. We're mm -hmm. talking with the Sunday school. We have a committee. We're talking to the leadership. Um, because these fears are not just placed with one group. They're usually throughout the system. And so yeah. you have to find the right people to facilitate conversations in a way that people feel safe to talk about their fears yeah. and a way to um, help them see what they how they can respond to those fears in a way that's productive and yeah. helps them move forward yeah and we and we have some good resources so you know, hopefully our communications team will put some of the tangible physical resources that you you mentioned in uh the link for this but also we have some good people resources people like iris uh lorraine stussman um we also sue. have yeah sue me, parker. But, yeah sue parker yeah Ken. And yeah, but yeah, but I, I don't have as much time. But yeah, we have some good good people uh, that can do these things. So make sure you call. On, I mean, you can call on me too, but uh, other people may be, be more available. But 
yeah, I think it's important that we we get the right help and we get the right training uh, available. Again, we're going to give you some resources to help you you navigate navigate this. Now, one other thing I think that's really interesting about it may be kind of unique to us, our staff, uh, Iris. You know, our staff is is demographically different than the majority of the people that we serve. Right? We we have different uh, racial uh, ethnic backgrounds on, on of our staff. But then there are many of our conference conferences who are dealing with an influx of uh, immigrants, uh, BIPOC people that may or may not have been there uh, for a while. So how do we think about about these identity based kind of issues and cultural competency as we as we start to reimagine the church? Because I think it's important, right? We're, we're getting people that come from a different ethnic identity to be a part of this predominantly Swiss Russian German denomination. Well, oh, I, I was, by the way, I should let everyone know that I'm a 11% Dutch. You know, I did my DNA. So, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a true, I'm a true uh, ethnic Mennonite now. 11% Dutch. All right, go ahead. Iris. All right. <laughs> um, well, you know, this is, this is a hard question and yet simple at the same time. Yeah. I mean, it's a paradox. Um, I think many times Groups put together committees or processes um, for change, Mm -hmm. even if it's, yeah, a little change, whatever. But usually BIPOC people are not at the table in the beginning of the stages. Right. And when I mean beginning, I mean the beginning of the discussion of the change. Mm -hmm. Um, And if we're not represented in those early stages, it's really hard for then the process to be really inclusive because then it looks like either tokenism or that you're an afterthought and no one wants to be an afterthought. Right. So inviting a diverse group of people in the beginning of a work uh, of change increases your chance of responding to the various communities um, because without their participation, relationships with diverse communities then can look and become paternalistic. Right. So I think we have to really be careful. I and mean, we can't represent every group. Right. You know, I mean, but to have a good representation is, is really important. And I, I also understand that churches feel uncomfortable to talk about racism. Mm. But the reality is white Christian nationalism is on the rise. So racism is also on the rise. So here's an opportunity for us as a church to shine a light as followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, The power of white Christian nationalism can be overpowered, I think, by God's love in standing with the vulnerable. And we have many tools to work at this. You know, if a congregation isn't ready to work on, uh, to become Mm anti-racism, they can begin at becoming intercultural competent. Yeah. Um, Because that's a segue into engaging in the hard work of anti-racism. Uh, we have a group of qualified administrators, I think like 18, that can help access and work uh, to build intercultural competency with individuals, congregations, and various groups. Now, the downside to this, and I, you know, is that sometimes people then stay focused on being intercultural competent only and not work on the anti-racism piece, mm-hmm. uh, which is more systemic. Right, right. Um, in nature. So I think that, you know, what we try to do, I know as a qualified administrator is to really make it clear that this is a segue to be interculturally competent, um, kind of opens the door for you to be more accepting of people that are not like you Mm -hmm. and more understanding of where they're coming from. And if you're able to do that, that really helps you in then working on the anti-racism piece, which looks at the systemic reality of race in all our institutions uh, throughout the U S. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah, sometimes it's hard for us to step out of these things. And especially now with the uh, polarizations in society, you mentioned the rise of Christian nationalism. And I think it has had an impact on our, on our church, our communities. Uh, I mean, I see that based on kind of how discussions flow, even in, within our denomination, um, so I think our Anabaptist identity is 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 important, and so I, part of this is yeah, really. Hey, how do we look 
back on the rich, richness of our heritage and our and our roots, but understand that now we, as we move into this new context in North America in, in particular, how do we how do we navigate that, and how do we uh, keep pace with change? Um, I think you know you know I think people ignore sometimes uh, how much. You know, you correct me if I'm wrong. How much Jesus paid attention to culture, right? You know, Jesus was was keenly aware of the culture of his day, right? And and he actually, I don't know. I guess I would say honored some of the cultural norms while at the same time pushing against them. And I think we forget that. You know, we just want to uh, either, either. I think we either Christians nowadays they, nowadays either totally ignore the influence of culture and try to live in this like it's a uh, two BC, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> or, or we, we, we just go full, full blown uh, thinking that American culture is Christian culture. Well, there's a really good verse about that. Okay. And I, I wish I, I wish I had my Bible right now, okay. uh, but I think it's in Luke, but you'll recognize it when I talk about the scripture scripture verse talks of when the disciples were asked to go and spread the news mm -hmm. and they were asked not to take any additional oh, yeah, clothes yeah. with them no food take nothing with them the reason for that was that when you enter a community and you don't bring your clothing your types of food your anything you are dependent mm -hmm. on that community and you yeah. then have to start to uh become part of that community eating their food, um, yeah. wearing clothes that they wear, not what we're used to, uh, yeah. living a lifestyle that that community lives. And so I think Jesus was keenly aware that in order to really spread the news mm -hmm. and to bring light to who Jesus is, we have to enter those communities in, in a way that's humble and accepting of who they are as a people. Right. Ooh. So yeah, I think Jesus is very conscious of of that. Yep, yep. And that's in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 10. You can find that when Jesus sends out the 12. And then, of course, he also sent out the 70 uh, in, in another verse of scripture. So those are things I think that we can learn and in, in, in how adaptive Jesus was. And, you know, I know some people say uh, we need a plain reading of the scripture, which I don't know what that means. I mean, I think... Uh, God has given us these minds and resources and intelligence and the and the work of the spirit for us to interpret some things. So um, I don't know. Jesus wasn't that plain. Sometimes, you know, you, you read some of those parables. Jesus was quite complex, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> even his disciples didn't understand him. Right. They don't understand everything. But we so, we're so smart now in 2024. We know, we know better than anything. Right. All and right, some people are gonna be really mad. Back. They're gonna say, "Oh, what are these people talking about? These leaders in the church?" <laughs> really, I'm just trying to understand scripture. I'm on a journey, uh, like like everybody else. And so, yeah, so things things are things are changing. Like, um, you know, I think churches change in general. Uh, the broad church, broader church, other than you know Anabaptist uh, denominations, the world is changing. Again, we have this weird meshing of. Uh, Christian nationalism and how that's impacting the church as a, as a whole. So, I mean, what, what would be some advice, other advice that you would have to leaders right now? What, you know, what skills do we need to be effective as maybe conference leaders or mm -hmm. congregational pastors? Well, uh, well, of course, as you know, Glenn, one of the things as a denomination we're looking at is, is actually looking at how we need to change. Mm -hmm. And we had, Put down three guiding principles and i think they're really good principles mm -hmm. i think one of them is that we look at how we can be transparent mm. in any in our process in our communication yeah um because we're the generation now and the generation to come puts a very high value on transparency right. and i mean i also do too uh, in the past, the church has always has not always been transparent, um, and you know people can say, "Well, that that was uh, that's how they did it then." Right, right. Well, it doesn't mean that it was right either. I mean, you know, when we even look at colonialism, well, that's yeah. how they did it then. Yeah, but it wasn't right. So I think being transparent is paramount. I think the other piece is. 
to be collaborative. Yeah. We're going to have to be more collaborative. In the U.S., we have become so individualistic that we think we alone can solve our own problems and that we don't need other people. Yes. I'm just talking yeah. about U.S. culture in yeah, general. Yeah. But the opposite is true. We need to be collaborative. We need to be hearing other voices. Mm -hmm. We need to work together to solve problems, to change institutions that work for everyone, not yeah. just one particular group. I think yeah. the other one, it sometimes is a lot harder. This one's gonna be hard for, again, any kind of religious institution, whether it's congregation, conference, even the denomination, is being able to be adaptive quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because things change so quick. You know, before, when I first started and did organizational development for, for a while, we could plan for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then it became 10. Now, I'm not so sure you can even plan for five. No. I mean, you know, I would say maybe three. Yeah. Uh, but because things are changing rapidly. Yeah. And I think that if we don't figure out a way to have systems um, and structures in our church across the board, not just the denomination, that can be adaptable and to be relevant to what is happening right now, we're going to be ineffective as a church. Yeah. And I think some of the, yeah, some of the old paradigms and some of the old way we did, did business, they don't serve as well now. I think even how people view the, the denomination. So I don't know if this is new or old, right? But this, this, this view that the Mennonite denominational, like the denominational staff, like we are kind of like this center of power. We are, you know, like, I, like I'm the, I'm the Pope uh, of, of the Mennonite church and that, you know, we are the holders of everything. Um, I don't know, maybe that's always existed in some form or fashion, but I think if we are going to be nimble, if we're really going to be effective at meeting people, we, we really need to have a a more Anabaptist understanding of how we do church, which means it's the priesthood of, of all believers that, you know, it isn't about the hierarchy, but it's about all of us making these conscious choices, these conscious decisions to, you know, basically follow Jesus, right? Uh, to to be peacemakers, to, uh, to be nonviolent, to to take care of the marginalized people. But if we, if, if all of our hope is in the institutional structure, I think we're going to, we're, we're going to lose. I think one of the roles, I think the denomination should really take hold of for the future yeah. Yeah. is to be the convener mm -hmm. of these discussions that we need to have on yeah. these critical issues. Not the deciders, but yeah. we convene and hear from each other. Um, and, you know, maybe our role is to summarize what we hear and, and share yeah. it with the church as they, at different levels, the congregation, the conference, make the decisions they need to make. Yeah. Um, so that they have a broad understanding across the church and hear those voices. Um, yeah, I... I always struggled with this idea that we make these big decisions up here, but you know, all the big decisions <laughs> that are ever made are always voted by the delegate assembly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not, not people, staff yeah. and it's not us, Yeah, but I understand how we're the kind of the center um, that they look to. And, and some people think, yeah, we're making these decisions or that we have a lot of influence in how the outcome Right, our decisions are made. Yeah. Um, they what they don't understand is our staff, like a lot of other places, are very diverse theologically. Yep. Uh, just like everyone else. Right. We are not all conservative. We are not all liberal. We span the spectrum, just like everyone else. Right. We we had an argument today about something, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this morning. <laughs> but, but we can disagree, I think, in healthy ways. And part of that, too, you know, so I'm going to go kind of back a little bit. Where we talked about, you know, you know, as we, you know, preparing people for change. One of the things I think is you know, how do we build trust uh, in the, the system? You know, how do we learn how to have these conversations? I think that 
part of our our challenge is is that we're trying to undo. You know, our staff we're trying to undo. Um, and I don't I don't want I don't want to discredit what our predecessors did. What what? But but we're trying to move into a different way of decision making, a different place of transparency because I think that's important. Right? Is really important for the younger generation as we move forward. This sense of transparency. We have more access to information than we we've ever had. Uh, you know, trust. I, I, I wrote this book called uh, Harmonious Trust uh, that and I share some of these principles with the board. But it's really important as we start having these conversations that we have a foundation of trust to operate under. Part of that is transparency. Uh, we need good leaders. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think part of this. I'll say this. I'm going to add this, Iris. This And this is my personal bias to this whole thing. We need good leaders to help people through. A change to help set the set the tone and set the pace. We have too many people in leadership positions that are not leaders. They're they're managers and they think leadership is sitting around in a room processing stuff all day. It's not. Not, not now. I'm not against processing. I'm not against bringing in diverse voices and those types of things to gather ideas to get a sense of where the people are going. But you have to have some type of leadership, someone that can guide people in a direction. Leaders, it's okay for you to have an opinion, to, to have a vision. Uh, that doesn't mean that you leave people behind because a good leader knows how to bring people along, how to gauge and assess these things. I think you mentioned that was one of the things, you know, to have other people de design processes, get diverse voices in. I'm not talking about being a dictator. I think part of our shortcoming sometimes in, in, in the Mennonite church is that we think leadership means dictator, and it, it, it does not. Well, I think part of that is historical experience that Mennonites yeah. have had about leaders. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, I'll just say part of me agrees with you, Glenn. The yeah. other part where I struggle with, especially yeah. recently, yeah. is sometimes we've had leaders that have their own agenda. Yeah, yeah. And they push that agenda. Now, they could say... And, and I think this is where the transparency part comes. Right. People need to be, you know, back in the day, they would say, well, the leaders, I mean, this is what I learned when I first became a leader, was that you're a non-anxious presence, number one. Number two is that um, you don't take a side. Eh, I don't believe that. Okay. Believe so yeah. number one, the yeah. non-anxious presence. Yeah. Uh, always uh, went against people of color because we have different ways of expressing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the non-anxious piece, yeah. I, I mean, I understand that in theory. Yeah. But it doesn't take into consideration cultural differences. Right. Second of all is that not taking a side. Well, when I have done, been in mediation pieces. Yeah. I think it's better for someone to say up if they have a position, they it's better to say up front what it is. Because if you don't or if you're not transparent about who you are and where right. you are, right. Then people get suspicious and they can't trust you. Yeah. Now I know that goes counter to what you know I was taught a long time ago, but I'm beginning to understand that Yeah. Uh, transparency is is paramount to trust, and as a leader, people have to trust you. Yeah, and, and also, I think owning up to when we make a mistake, owning up to it. Right. So, because because uh, you know, like I did this morning, like you did this morning, right? Because Michael <laughs> Michael Danner and Iris don't, you know, they do whatever. Right? They just like I'm supposed to be their boss, but they just kind of they just do their own thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But they, but they disagree with me, right? You and Michael disagree with me all the time, and sometimes uh, you all win. Sometimes I win. Um, <laughs> there's sometimes when I say, "Hey, well, I'm the boss. I'm gonna make this decision." And sometimes I say, hey, "Iris, you know more about this than I do. You're gonna make the decision." I think that's a healthy uh, uh, way of, way of working. And uh, you know, I come to you all with ideas, and you come to me with ideas. But you know, they're it's very clear about roles and responsibilities. And I think that's part of leadership. Um, you know, I've had seen some leaders in the church really destroy communities by saying they don't have an opinion when they really did. And they, and they led processes that, that left 
uh, their constituents broken and confused. That's to me, that's not acceptable as a, as, as a leader. So, I mean, you all have to figure out what your, your leadership journey is. Uh, uh, we'll put some resources out that you all can check out. You can go to Amazon and check out my book on trust. There's some exercises in there that you all could, um, could look at, but I, I do think it's important. You know, you know, Iris mentioned, you know, the pace of change is, is, is accelerating for, for all of us. And, uh, Historically, we've done a bad job in some of these nonprofit sectors, especially the church and educational systems of uh, of adapting. Any any other hopes and dreams you, uh, you have, Iris, or comments? Yeah, I just want to say I think um, I, I think this thing. Either we help shape the, our change. It's, yeah, change is going to happen. It's not whether. Are we going to change or not? Change is happening. Yeah. So we can either participate that and help mold it to our values and who we are, mm -hmm. or we can let it happen to us. Yeah. And um, so my advice is to embrace the change. Mm -hmm. um, and the other piece is that trust is paramount to for leaders if they're going to work at leading the change in their perspective areas. Yeah. One of the things too, again, I really like these principles, Ira, so hopefully we can get this out to people about anticipating, designing, and, and implementing. I think we we kind of get stuck in processing again in, in <laughs> or design, maybe the designing part in, in Midnight Church USA, we never get to the implementation part. But Two, I've been a part of a number of transitions, transformation processes with a number of groups. Uh, I will say this because it's just this is just how I'm feeling today. Every group of Mennonite Church USA feels like it's marginalized, right? The conservatives feel like they don't have a place. You know, oh, there's no place for conservatives. The LGBT people feel like they don't have a place in the denomination. The people of color don't feel like they have a place that they're marginalized. The the rural churches have told me that they're marginalized, and we don't we don't care about about them. Uh, the West Coast people feel marginalized. You know, it's just everybody feels marginalized and says, hey, you're not including us. And then it's hard for us to come up with a plan, like a, a plan that we where we can work together. It's always just about you made us feel bad. And look, look, yeah, I'm, I had to be careful how I say this, but you made us you made us feel bad. You don't like us. But, it, you know, part of change is we actually okay that's that's great we do as a church as, as people of of god we we're, we care we're concerned we have emotions and feelings and all those things are good but at some point we have to have a pathway forward right we have to have a direction some plans we have to sit down and it's not just enough to say you don't like me we have to say this is our vision this is how we're going to emulate uh the 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 Holy Spirit in our, in our work, but we need some tangible things to take us forward. Yeah, I think um, I think in, in some way is how, and I'll just talk for myself as a Latina, is um, I think, you know, voicing our concerns yeah. is important. But I also think for myself was taking responsibility for what I could do to make things different. And and sometimes, you know, if I waited mm -hmm. for the church to make the difference, yeah. I could still be waiting. Yeah. Um, so I think it's trying to find that balance of yeah. you know, the church can make some changes, it's gonna be slow. I mean, no matter what, I you know, mm -hmm. um or you know, we can start making the changes within our our fear of influence. Yeah, yeah. Um, and those change, like Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. If you, those small group can make a big impact. Yeah. And I think yeah. we need to, you know, can be super spreaders of an super idea. Spreaders. We can be infectious. Yeah, we can be <laughs> infectious. Yeah. People. Yeah, we, we should be all be able to understand that. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, we need to start. Uh, of course, I'm a you know the seven seven enneagram seven. Per, so taking opportunities and, and and pushing forward is not hard for me at all. And I do realize that people have different leadership styles that we need to take into consideration. But if you are a leader, I do think it's important for you to think about these things. You know, how are you anticipate? What are you doing to anticipate change? You know, what are you studying? What are you reading? 
uh, what time are you spending, you know, kind of looking toward the future. I think that's important for all of us as leaders. And, and you have to do this. You can't, I mean, there may be times when you do it collectively, but you as a leader have to do some of this personal work, I think. Uh, and and it doesn't mean that we leave our community. You know, you're hearing that, but I think it's, hear me when I say that, but I think we as leaders, it's important for us to do some of this personal work. And then, you know, what you definitely can do in the collective is designing for the change and, and, uh, and implementing the change. Things where we, where we bring in the right people, we bring in the right voices. Uh, we want to make sure that certain parts of our community are heard. We, there, again, there's no perfect solution to any of this. We will make mistakes along the way, but I think, but it's important for us as leaders to start thinking about what needs to change. Um, I, and I'll say, you know, Michael Danner and I uh, argue about this all the time because Michael said, hey, what problem are we trying to solve? I said, Michael, sometimes we just need to change stuff. And so, <laughs> but we do. I mean, I like change and I think that change keeps us motivated, keeps us sharp, but there are, there should be concrete reasons why you are looking to change. Uh, so I do like that question, you know, you know, what problem do we, we hope to hope to solve, which is a current focus thinking, but also, Hey, what are the potential problems moving forward? I mean, just think about, we're getting ready to deal with this very polarized election. Iris has already given me some ideas of things that we can do as a church in anticipation of the potential fallout. We don't know what it's going to be, but as leaders, we're trying to think six, seven months down the, down the uh, road as a minimum to say, these are some things we need to start thinking about and shifting our resources in that direction. Well, I think that the other thing, Glenn, that you touched upon, I, I think, yeah, leaders should always be doing their own personal work. I yeah. mean, but I think the other piece is one of the things leaders, a good leader is to know what their, their gifts are and their limits. Mm -hmm. And then those places where they aren't gifted yeah. is trying to find the people they need to to help them in that leading. Um, because I don't think like all leaders are idea people. Mm -mm. Um, but on their team, they should have somebody that's an idea people. Right. They should have someone that's networks. Uh, they, yeah, I mean, it's a variety of gifts that are needed. Um, but it has to be someone that can lead a team or lead that movement forward for change. Yep. And leaders trust your people. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things I try to do is hire good people that uh, help keep me focused, help keep me out of trouble and uh, that are smarter <laughs> than me. So thankfully, Iris is one of those people. Uh, Iris has inspired me over the years. Uh, Iris has been a pioneer in the church for, for BIPOC people. Uh, she has motivated me to, to learn things and to hone my skills. So my hat's off to Iris. Uh, she's, she's been doing this for a while, but she uh, still seems to be enthusiastic and, and really cares for for the church, for the church as a, as a whole. So, Iris, I'm thankful for uh, the work that you do. I thank you for taking on this 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 uh, process of helping us to reimagine church. I think it's something that we desperately need. Hopefully people will take advantage of this and take advantage of some of our great staff people if they are looking to start a change process in their in their area. Any any last words, Iris? No, but I yeah, thank you for having me on and thank you for the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so as we wrap up, uh if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest that is happening in Mennonite Church USA, subscribe to Peace Mail. Peace Mail is our weekly email newsletter. Subscribe at MennoniteUSA.org slash peacemail. That's MennoniteUSA.org slash peacemail. And you know that your financial support matters. Please consider supporting the ongoing ministry work of Mennonite Church USA. And that's MennoniteUSA.org slash give. Thank you for your time and for your support. <laughs>